Matthew chapter 8, and we will look at verses 18 through 22. Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 20, through 20, isn't that interesting, same verses, but anyway, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, and as you know, we're preaching a sermon series this fall on the call to discipleship, the simple words that Christ gave to the apostles, gives to us that we are to follow him, and we began that series uh, three weeks ago. And due to my illness being out, we are just now getting back. You notice that we're skipping over the Sermon on the Mount and going to the next passage that we find in Matthew's Gospel that addresses this issue of following the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is Matthew 8, verses 18 through 22. Now, kind of to give you an idea of how we're going in Matthew, we will come back to the Sermon on the Mount sometimes early in 2018. Uh, once we get through this series of sermons on Christian discipleship, we're going to go back through and look at the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew. Uh, so we are skipping over it now. We will be coming back to it at a later date. But Matthew 8, verses 18 through 22 will be our focus this morning. Uh, the title of the sermon is, Follow Me Now. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the Word of God. And thank you for the witness that we have in Scripture uh, concerning the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not have to wonder. We do not have to question. We do not have to doubt. We know exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ taught in his preaching ministry uh, due to the Scriptures that are before us in this particular passage that is before us now. Lord, well, there are so many messages in the church and in culture today about what it means to be a Christian. And it only makes sense that we would go back to the words of Christ and to listen to his teaching and to listen to his words and get the truth from his own uh, glorious person. So we pray that by the Spirit of God, Christ himself would come in these moments and that his word would be spoken into each and every heart in this room. We pray these things in our Savior's name and for his sake. Amen. Verse 18, Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. It is the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes. And birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to, to bury their own dead. This is the word of the Lord. The response of Christ in the Gospels to crowds is an interesting study. Sometimes we see the Lord Jesus Christ teaching the crowds and sometimes feeding them. We think of the feeding of the 5,000. Sometimes we see the Lord Jesus Christ avoiding crowds or running from crowds like we see in our passage. And sometimes we see him purposefully downsizing the crowds with his teaching, taking a large group of people and whittling, whittling them down through what he is teaching. Christ always confounds, he always surprises, and he always challenges us, and we certainly see this in his response to the crowds. Well, as you see in our passage today, in verse 18, uh, he is running from this crowd, not because he's scared, uh, but he is wanting to distance himself from the crowd. And notice he gave orders to his disciples to go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to get away from the crowds. What explains this? Was Christ agoraphobic? Uh, I went to the preacher's friend several weeks ago and typed in fear of crowds just to see <laughs> what was online about the fear of crowds, and I found the words uh, demophobia, 
Ocalophobia and anoclophobia. It sounds like Chicken Little wrote the entry in, in Wikipedia. And as we know, another word for the fear of crowds is agoraphobia. Well, mark my word. Christ did not suffer from any phobias. He was the divine, eternal Son of God. Therefore, he was omniscient. He knew all men. He knew the danger of crowds. He knew the thoughts of each person in the crowd that he was distancing himself from. And he knew human weakness, the tendency to follow the crowd. So he provides sobering teaching to challenge the crowd. Why do you really want to follow me, he seems to be saying. You know, at this point, Christ is so unlike many modern preachers and many modern Christians who think just because we have a large crowd, God is at work. Now, we would like a large crowd. Don't get me wrong. But Christ was totally unimpressed, absolutely unimpressed with the size of the crowd listening to him. Let me ask, what pastor would look at a congregation of 5,000 men, now that was not counting women and children in the feeding of the 5,000, and then begin to teach in such a way that the crowd was 12 when he got through with them? That pastor probably wouldn't get a raise that year. He surely wouldn't be asked to teach at the great uh, church growth seminar. But that is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did in John chapter 6. As the people were just simply wanting a meal for their belly, yet Christ was intent on giving them news of eternal life, a meal for their soul. So it's an interesting study in Scripture to see how Christ responds to crowds. And we see that in verse 18 of our passage today. But it looks like there are two individuals that get to him anyway. One is a scribe, one is called a disciple, that get to the Lord Jesus Christ and he interacts with them and discusses with them what it really means to be his disciple. Notice first of all Jesus and the scribe. You see that in verses 19 through 20 and let's notice several things about this man. First of all he was a scribe. In all likelihood he was Jewish. The scribes in the Old Testament church were responsible for copying the scriptures and doing it accurately. I don't know if you've ever done any studies in that regard to see how careful the Old Testament scribes were with their copies of the scripture but they had all sorts of checks and balances to make sure when they had written a line on the parchment that it was exactly what they were copying from and that practice was in Israel for many many centuries so he was a serious man about the things of God uh, religion was his vocation he was a scribe this was the man that came up to him and said, I will follow you wherever you go. Notice he addressed Christ with respect. You see that in verse 19. Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now we are not entirely sure why he used this designation teacher. Could he have heard or at least heard about Christ's Sermon on the Mount? Notice this follows the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5, 6, and 7. It could have been he heard of the authority of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, and he was impressed by that, and that is why he called Christ teacher. Maybe he had heard about the religious sensation in Galilee as a result of Christ's ministry. We do not know here, but there was some degree of recognition on the part of the scribe that Christ was a teacher in Israel, that his teaching carried authority, and that he needed to listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ was saying. Notice the man's vow or the man's promise. I'll follow you wherever you go. Now one thing we can say for sure, the scribe had heard Christ's call to discipleship. 
in the modern church, it's kind of like pray the prayer, join the church, you know, and Jesus, I will see you on the judgment day, and, and hopefully I'll be okay. No sense of discipleship in following the Lord Jesus, or very little. But this man had heard, and he knew that Jesus was issuing a call to follow him, follow Christ in his ministry. He had heard Christ's call to discipleship. It was a call to follow wherever Christ might lead. And the scribe said, I'm willing. I'll do it wherever, whenever, and however. Now before we look at Christ's response to the man in, in verse 20, let's uh, think about how many of us would respond to such an individual in our day. Sign him up. Put him in charge of the outreach committee. Give him maybe six months and make him an elder or make him an officer or make him a deacon within the church. We would say, wow, here comes this man in response to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, I will follow you wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. We would have them in church membership before the sun went down. But notice how Christ responds to the man. Foxes, we saw, this is it's so funny, isn't it, Lynn? There was a fox out in the road on Donaldson Road when we were coming up here this morning. There was a flock of turkeys that flew across the road on the day that I come to meet with the elders about being your minister. God has interesting signs, doesn't he? Foxes have holes. Birds of the air, they got their nests. But the Son of Man is homeless, is what he's saying. Nowhere to lay his head. In other words, the smallest of creatures have homes in which to reside. God, my heavenly Father, according to Christ, he provides for the birds, he provides for the little critters, he provides for everything that he has created, but his own son comes to the face of this earth and he has no dwelling place, no home, no place to lay his head. The son of God, the son of man, is homeless. You ever think about the profundity of that? The God who made it all comes to this earth as a man and is incarnate. And he's living on the streets. Now, I'm not going to develop this today. We'll get to it later on in our studies in Matthew. But that title, Son of Man, is very, very significant in the Gospel of Matthew and other places in the Gospel. It is the most common self-designation that Christ uses of himself. In the, when he's describing himself in the gospel, he usually uses this term, son of man. And if you will study that in the Old Testament, you will see in Daniel chapter 7, there is this tremendous vision or this image of God handing over an eternal kingdom to one likened to the son of man. In the book of Daniel, this eternal kingdom that is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is portrayed, it is prefigured, it is predicted in the book of Daniel and in other places in the Old Testament. And in that vision in Daniel 7, the Ancient of Days gives the eternal kingdom to the Son of Man. You think there's a connection here? I think there is. Jesus is the king of the glorious kingdom of God. And yet he has come to rescue his people, that Christ would love sinners so much that he would endure homelessness. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, that we are to consider the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, 
yet for our sakes he became poor so that we through his poverty might be made rich. Now is Christ unkind in his response to the scribe? I mean, after all, that's pretty good on the part of the scribe. Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you want me to go. Do whatever you want me to do. I don't think Christ's response was unkind at all. He doesn't criticize the scribe. He doesn't belittle the scribe. He doesn't question the sincerity of his promise. He simply instructs the scribe. Jesus says, Think about me and what I'm enduring on this earth. And as he says elsewhere in the book of Matthew, the the disciples are not above their teacher. In other words, if it's happening to me, it may very well happen to you if you follow me. Jesus is saying, follow me is not popular. You might be driven from your home. The costs are high. The demands of Christian discipleship are excruciating at times. Jesus is just simply speaking the truth of God to this man. And he needed to hear it. Those of you that were able to read in the section in Ryle dealing with this passage, remember that these are some words from J.C. Ryle about this passage. And notice what he says. It would be well for the churches of Christ if these sayings of our Lord were more remembered than they are. It may well be feared that the lesson they contain is too often overlooked by the ministers of the gospel and that thousands are admitted to full communion, that is church membership, who have never been warned to count the cost. Nothing, in fact, has done more to harm Christianity than the practice of filling the ranks of Christ's army with every volunteer who is willing to make a little profession and talk fluently of his experience. It has been painfully forgotten that numbers alone do not make strength and that there may be a great quantity of mere outward religion while there is yet very little real grace. Let us all remember this. Let us keep back nothing from young professors and inquirers after Christ. Do you see what Ryle is saying there? The way we tend to think is get them in the church and then six months, 12 months down the road, let them know how difficult being a Christian is. Ryle says, no, do it at the front door. Let them know on the front end what they are getting into. Let us not enlist them on false pretenses. Let us tell them plainly that there is a crown of glory at the end, but let us tell them no less plainly that there is a daily cross in the way. So the scribe. Let's look at this second individual that Christ uh, counsels in this passage. Uh, This one in verse 21 that is called another of the disciples. Now the inference here in verse 21 is that the scribe was a disciple too. You read the commentators on this and there's great distinction being made between the mass of people that were following Christ as supposed disciples at the time and the twelve. We know that the twelve was a mixed bag as well. But it seems like these are individuals that are beginning to listen. They are beginning to follow. They are beginning to consider the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have another of the disciples, and he comes up, and notice what he says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. That seems pretty legitimate, doesn't it? I mean, he has what appears to be a legitimate excuse for delaying an aspect of his discipleship. He must go and bury his father. And let us think about this for just a minute. The death of a loved one puts everything on hold. I saw that this week in the death of my friend. 
got the news in an email Monday morning. It was like my whole week was governed after that to planning and getting ready to go to his funeral. He was just a friend. How much more if it is your father or your mother or another family member? Now, another thing going on here is in Jewish culture at that time, this was a very big deal in light of the fifth commandment to honor your father and your mother. There was a strict obligation that rested on the children. The children were expected, and rightly so, to provide a proper burial for their parents. And Jesus in the passage seems to be disregarding that noble and that good and that understandable tradition by telling this man that he needs to put discipleship over the funeral of his father. This is not an easy passage. Not an easy passage to explain. It's not an easy passage to meditate on and take in. How do we explain this? And furthermore, how do we get Jesus off the hook? I mean, the integrity of the Lord Jesus Christ is at stake here. We need to be careful in our explanation. And another thing that makes this difficult in the passage in giving it explanation, there's nothing said to explain. I mean, it's just out there. There's no other verses to tell us what was really going on here? Besides what is there when Jesus says, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Now, commentators over the years have offered two explanations here. Uh, and, and both of these are speculations because you can't find them in the text. They're just guessing. Some have reasoned that the disciple's father was alive and well. And in other words, the disciple was delaying the, uh, uh, the discipleship or the demands of Christ's discipleship over an unknown period of time because his father was alive and well. Some people have taken that position that the disciple was using this as an excuse, a lame excuse, to dodge discipleship. And his father had many years to live, and this disciple just told an absolute whopper to the Lord Jesus Christ. So some have said that the disciple's father was alive and well. Others have reasoned that the disciple's father was sick and that he was close to death. In other words, the professed disciple was saying, I'll get there, Jesus, in a, in a day or two, or maybe a week or two, but I'm going to be there. He was delaying discipleship. So the disciple played it safe here. He stayed close to home in case his father died soon. So those are two of the explanations that have been given over the years to get Jesus off the hook in this passage. They're all speculation. Both of them are speculation. We just don't know. I suggest that we take the passage at face value. And that the man's father indeed had died, had died recently. His son was in the process of preparing the funeral. And Jesus said, no, nope, there's more important matters. You come follow me. And from the Luke passage you see, and preach the kingdom of God. I mean, does Jesus not have the right of primary allegiance? He's the divine, eternal Son of God. And he is building this kingdom, this glorious kingdom that is unseen to our eyes. But if we would see the implications of the war that is going on, between the forces of light and the forces of darkness, we would better understand what the Lord Jesus is teaching here. He is saying that he comes before everything and everybody in our lives. 
And if we do not recognize that and live our lives in light of that, we may not have a clue as to what it means to be a Christian. One of my most treasured possessions is a telegram that my father received, and he received that telegram in the Pacific Theater during World War II. And it's the telegram that informed him his dad had died. The telegram is dated June 5th, 1945. And I talked to my dad about it. And if I remember the story correctly, which is a big if when you hit close to 60, but I think I've got it correctly, that it was almost three months after my grandfather's death before my dad got the telegram. And do you think that it was some flowery, ornate, beautiful sympathy card? Here is how my dad found out about his own father's death. And this is a quote. I took it off. The, I was going to bring the telegram to the pulpit this morning, but the thing is so frail, and I just don't want to lose it. Obviously, it's very valuable. So I just wrote down what the telegram said. For Ben Douglas Barcroft, father died June 3rd. Signed, Mrs. H.B. O'Daniel. That is how my dad found out about his father's death. Now let me ask the question. When my grandfather died, why didn't World War II just grind to a halt? Why didn't, was it Roosevelt at the time or had Roosevelt died in 1945? It was Truman, right? I need to study my American history here. But whoever the, I mean, I mean, when the news of the death of my grandfather got to Washington, why didn't the president just stand up and say, okay, war's off, everything's done, bring Ben Barcroft back to America so he can bury his father, and when he's done, the war can go on. Well, the death of my grandfather was a monumental event. But national events took precedent. They took priority. Our nation was at war. Our national interests were in jeopardy. The Axis powers were committed to destroying the United States of America. National interests trumped everything. And they took priority even over family. Well, people, there's a greater war going on than World War II. And it's the great battle of the ages. The battle of Satan's kingdom versus the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you seen that? Has it dawned in your mind? Has it dawned in your heart? That that takes priority over everything in life. Matthew 4, 17 that we saw last time, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is... It is at hand. It is here. The divine, eternal Son of God has come to this world to destroy the forces of evil. And it takes priority over all human kingdoms and all human endeavors. Now don't get me wrong. When loved ones die, you'll go to funerals and you'll prepare for those funerals. But if Jesus Christ were to come on the scene and give you a command to stop and come follow him, you would if you were his. And 
And the vast majority of times he doesn't do that. But he's making a point here about his kingdom. I want to make three points of application in conclusion. First of all, Christ confronts our priorities. He confronts our tendency to deny true discipleship. That is, to put him and his kingdom first in his lives, in our lives. It was so, it is so clear in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Christ challenges our misplaced priorities and our tendency to place anything over Christ and his kingdom. Secondly, Christ confronts our procrastination. He confronts our tendency to delay discipleship, to put it off. He challenges our misplaced sense of time to fail to see the urgency of divine things and to think that there are other things in life that are more important than the kingdom of God. One commentator by the name of Michael Green said, at all events, it is a warning, that is, the teaching of this passage is a warning against missing the boat and a challenge to respond and begin discipleship while opportunity knocks. Have you seen the big question mark in this passage? Since you're not seeing, yeah, I'll go ahead and tell you what it is. We're not told about these men. We're not told about the scribe. We're not told about the disciple, whether they obeyed the teaching that Christ is giving here. There's this huge uncertainty in this passage. If we have any curiosity at all in reading, what happened to these men? Are they going to be in heaven one day, or are they in hell right now? Because these are the issues that are at stake in their lives. Maybe the big question mark is not there for them, but is there for us. Have we complied? Have we seen the value of the kingdom of God? Have we seen in our own individual lives the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ and the wonder of His divine love that the divine eternal Son of God would become the Son of Man and walk the face of this earth homeless so that we could be forgiven and we could be free and we could follow Him in our lives and tell the whole world of His grace and His love and His kindness. Christ confronts our question mark as to whether we are going to follow and that is now. And then Christ confronts our playfulness and that is our tendency to dodge true discipleship, to adopt comfortable, cultural Christianity. Let us make no mistakes that will take you to judgment. Jesus says, broad is the way. He was talking to the church in the Sermon on the Mount. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. But narrow is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that see this. He challenges us to not play games with our souls. And he challenges us to not play games with the things of the kingdom of God. He challenges our misplaced sense of Christian commitment. The old Puritan Matthew Henry said, There are many resolutions for religion produced by sudden pangs of conviction that prove abortive and come to nothing. Soon ripe, soon rotten. And the wonderful writer Philip Edgecombe Hughes has a little book that some of you have read and it's under the simple title and it goes like this, No Cross, No Crown. No Cross, No Crown. This is what Jesus is teaching in the passage. 
You want to follow me? It might be hard. You want to follow me? You may be in the minority. You want to follow me? You've got to deal with your anger and deal with your doubt. Deal with your mistreatment of people. Deal with your lack of commitment to the local church. And as we said before, and as I prepared you in the letter that I sent out about these studies, Christ is portraying for us what saving faith looks like. It's not like we do these things and earn his favor. But when we see his glory, just like the hymn we sang earlier that you've heard me quote 10,000 times in this place, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, demands my life, and demands my all. We'll fail, we'll stumble, we'll sin. But when we have saving faith, we are headed to a goal, and that's to please the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Let us pray. Father, I just...